This is Michael Lukies, Communications Manager for After School, and I'm here with Youth Service America President and CEO Steve Culbertson to talk about why today's teens want to do good in the world and how they're doing it. After School and Youth Service America partner together to provide the millions of teens teens on the After School app with easy access to get involved in positive activities and social causes. Through this partnership, students can apply for YSA's grants and scholarships, including the Disney Summer of Service grant. Steve, how are you? I'm great, Michael. How are you? Doing great. Tell us a little bit about Youth Service America. Sure. Well, we changed our name. I'll start right there um, from Youth Service America to YSA a few years ago um, when we started working both inside and outside of America. Um, so uh, if you don't mind, I'll call us YSA throughout the interview. But, um, you know, we did start as Youth Service America. When I got here in uh, 1996, we worked in uh, just the USA. And um, now we're working in more than 120 countries worldwide. Wow. So, so why, this, is, uh, this has gone global. <laughs> I see this. <laughs> so why do today's teens want to do good things? Well, I, you know, I, I might change that question uh, around and, and just remove the word today because I think kids and teenagers in particular have always wanted to do good things. Um, I think it's an, an innately human thing, uh, and especially for young people, uh, to want to be at the table, to want to participate, to want to contribute. And I just think that there are so many more opportunities today than we've ever seen in human history. And that's why it seems like there's this uh, sort of change in the hearts and minds of young people. But I think this is um, this, this idea of uh, I've got something to contribute to my community is very much part of, of what it means to be a human being. And it's probably deeply embedded into our DNA and into the whole evolution of humans over the last 175,000 years is that the reason that we progressed so much faster than any other species was this element of contribution um, that we all were expected to contribute. And I think we've just got more chances and more opportunities to do it. So it seems like today's teens are, are perhaps more philanthropic, more service-minded, um, but I think this has been something that's always been part of, of what it means to be, uh, you know, part of the human race. So if you see this awareness kind of evolving to a greater level through technology, how do you think we can continue to capitalize on that? Well, I, I think you, you know, you nailed it on the technology piece. You know, I, I walked into YSA in, in 1996 and I said to the team, what are you guys doing on the Internet? And our director of programs snapped his head up and he said, you know what the Internet is? <laughs> and I said, yeah, um, you know, I, I, and what are we doing with it and how are we taking advantage of it? Well, of course, as, as we fast forward 20 years, um, the Internet has been our friend. The Internet has been the reason that we've been able to take this movement uh, of, of very intentional uh, contributions by young people uh, to a global basis. We're able to translate things with Google Translate. We're able to send things literally around the world in seconds. We're able to interact. We're able to send documents. People are able to upload documents on the other side of the world that we've put up, you know, 10 minutes before. So I, I think technology has definitely been our friend. But I also think that there's, there's another, um, uh, another play at work here, and that is that technology has also exposed young people. Now, you know, you, you remember when uh, we switched into the new millennium and everybody said Jesus was coming and the ATMs weren't going to work. You know, that was the, those were the two big sort of, um, you know, lines that you heard in the media. And, of course, you know, we didn't see Jesus and the, and the ATMs worked really well. So, you know, what changed, however, was that we had 9-11. We had the uh, war in Afghanistan. We had the Iraq war. We had the Pakistani earthquakes. We had the Chinese earthquakes. We had extraordinary um, weather events. We had terrorist events. Um, we had all kinds of things that, that young people were exposed to. And they were able to see them in real time, and they were able to um, tweet about them. They were able to post them on their Facebook page. They were able to trade videos. And so I think that reinforced the fact that, you know, whether you're looking at health, 
with HIV and AIDS or, you know, right up to the Zika virus today, uh, to education, you know, with a big focus on, on uh, um, what, what happens and how dangerous it is to drop out of high school, you know, in this economy and in this day and age. Uh, human service, um, just the way that we take care of each other, human rights, you know, as, as we've seen um, the gay rights movement um, get even stronger and, and other kinds of movements towards girl power and making sure every girl gets an education. And certainly the environment, uh, you know, as we've seen climate change and the effects of it, um, which were predicted 20 years ago and they're coming 30 years ago and they're coming true now. So I think kids have been exposed to stuff um, today unlike any generation in human history. And I think that's been a big motivating factor for why they want to contribute, why they want to get deeply involved in helping to solve these problems. And they're not waiting to grow up before they do it. So is there a saturation point where we're throwing so many things at them? I mean, with technology, these teams have so many different things they can get involved in and so many different companies and even nonprofits trying to get their time and attention. Do we Are we getting a saturation point? How do we remain impactful when it comes to promoting these opportunities for teams? Well, I think the, the great news is that, that there's this larger um, issue of being at the table. And I think every young person wants to be at that table. You know, if, if you think back at the original decision-making table, you know, going back a couple hundred years ago, it was basically white males, you know, property-owning, English-speaking that were making all the decisions. And today we've really expanded that table. Uh, you know, if you think about the United States, that table is now chaired by a black man whose mother was born in Kansas and whose father was born in Kenya. Um, you know, and it's a very rich and diverse table. Um, there are still not enough young people around that table. And I think that's the, the battle I keep saying to young people. If you want to be at the table, you've got to fight for it. Everybody else at that table has fought for it. And you need to raise your voice and make sure that you're heard as well and, you know, and demanding a place and, uh, you know, to be a contributor. So I, I think that um, I'm not worried about the saturation point. Um, I'm worried about getting more young people at the table. I think the, you know, when you think about the diversity, it's a bit like cable TV. There's a channel for everybody. Um, and whether you're deeply interested in climate change and I'm deeply interested in Alzheimer's and somebody else is deeply interested in marine conservation, I think just the, the rich variety of the problems facing the planet um, are so diverse and, and can be connected to practically any issue. Um, I just got back from Abu Dhabi, for example, and I met with a young Arab boy there who is using cricket. Um, now, nobody in America plays cricket, um, at least not many people do. Um, but he's using cricket as a way of getting people's attention around big important issues about human rights and, and uh, taking care of children in Africa. So what I'm finding is that kids are using their sparks, what, what they care deeply about. So we're really meeting them where they are, you know, whether it's sports or arts or, you know, cooking or, you know, web design, whatever it is. Um, what we're saying to young people today is don't change. You know, bring yourself to the table. Bring your skills. Bring your passions. Bring your sparks. And then we'll show you how to use those to change the world. And what is the potential of today's teams to make an impact on the world? Well, I, I think the potential of today's teens is extraordinary. Um, and I say that because I think they, they bring three unique uh, capabilities to that table that adults don't have. The first one is they are absolutely passionate about new things. So that drives parents crazy, right? When the, you know their their head spins from one shiny thing to another, and they get a new toy, and all of a sudden, you know that toy they don't even look at it anymore because they see a new toy that they want. Well, that's actually part of the evolutionary process um, that we see where. Young people are attracted to new ideas and are always constantly coming up with them. And they see things and they see patterns and they see, um, you know, they have this capacity for novelty that adults simply don't have. And I like to say, you know, it's, it's no coincidence that it was teenagers who started some of the best companies in the world, whether it's UPS or Subway or Oculus or Facebook or Hewlett-Packard or Bristol-Myers or 
um, you know, Microsoft and Apple. I mean, these were all teenagers that, you know, were puttering around with, with new ideas. So I think, you know, the potential for young people to bring new solutions to old problems is extraordinary if we can, again, you know, bring them to the table uh, and get them deeply involved and, and have that opportunity for them. The second thing that they're really good at after novelty is risk-taking. You know, kids will take risks that adults simply won't take. And, you know, it's, it's not that they do crazy things. You know, um, it's not that they're jumping off the Empire State Building. They just don't have the, you know, the filter of this won't work or that'll never work. And, you know, they just do it. Um, and they take those risks. And, you know, we have this great adage in, in the English language that says, no risk, no reward. Well, guess what? When kids, when kids take risks, they get rewards. And so they recognize that. So risk-taking is, is a key part of adolescence that I think we need to tap into and encourage. And, of course, you know, we see that in the entrepreneurial movement, but we almost breed risk-taking out before these entrepreneurs you know, um, start working on their project. And we have to you know, convince them, no, 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 take the risk, take the risk. This is a good thing. So um, you've got novelty, you've got risk-taking. And then the third thing that, that young people are really good at uh, is bringing their peers along. And remember, you know, and, and again, any authority figure always has to remember this, is that young people listen to other young people more than they listen to adults. And that's, again, a biological thing, you know, where they're checking their behavior. They don't want to get too far ahead of their peers, and they don't want to lag behind them. So, you know, they check themselves, hey, what are they doing? And, and so you see a lot of that kind of, um, you know, peer authority. So when young people are leading social change efforts, they're able to bring their peers along with them. So it's this powerful force that if you get one, you know, you'll get 10, you'll get 20, you know, other young people that will come with them. And so I think we need to tap into that, recognize that, and, and realize that we can really move the mountain um, if we can great, you know, get great leaders uh, and, you know, get them in the position where they can bring their friends along with them. So I think those three things um, – give us extraordinary potential, again, that, that we need to tap into if we're going to solve some of these big problems facing the planet. So going back to YSA's history, why is YSA passionate about making a positive change? Well, again, I think if you look at our, our mission statement, it's, it's, it's about making a positive change with young people at the center of it. And Again, I would say that it's always been young people who've changed the world. You know, it's not older people that change the world. They, they become champions for these young people. But I think those new ideas, that idea of moving the ball forward, of doing things a different way, of adding a new technique or stirring the pot in a different way, um, you know, and, and this is true whether you're looking at agriculture or whether you're looking at music or whether you're looking at any of the arts, um, you know, it's, it's always these, you know, young writers and young performers and young singers and young producers and, and um, you know, young musicians. Um, and, and so I think as you look at that, um, you see that if we're really going to continue to progress as a society, uh, that we need the help of young people front and center. And, and yet, and yet, you know, I was in Africa. I was down in uh, Lesotho, which is a country, and you know, it's surrounded by South Africa. And I had this 16-year-old Black African girl come up to me, and she said, "Steve, you're the first adult that's ever given me permission to change the world." And not 30 days later, Michael, I had a girl come up to me, same age, 16-year-old Jewish girl in New York City, and said, "Steve, you're the first adult that's ever given me permission to change the world." Now that was 8,000 miles away. Two girls said the exact same thing. At that point, you know, I'm sitting there going, there isn't enough of me to go around talking to the world. How do I use technology to convince young people um, that we need them to change the world, um, to give them that quote-unquote permission that they feel they need? And so I think in many ways, you know, this is what YSA does is, is we're really – our mission is to champion, you know, young people as changemakers. So other than utilizing technology, what are some of the keys or secrets to activating youth to make that change? How are you able to accomplish that? Well, I, I think the, the first secret to activating a young person is, 
is to really find out who they are. Um, you know, I met with a bunch of um, uh, middle school students the other day, and it was early in the morning. They'd been traveling, you know, from New York. They were visiting D.C., and I walked in the room, and I was going to give this presentation, and I realized that that was going to fall flat on its face, just given the, you know, the, the tenor of the room and, you know, sort of the look on their faces when I walked in as, oh, gosh, they've got to sit through another talk. Um, and I thought, you know, I really need to reach them where they are. And so I went around to each of them and I asked them, you know, what do they love doing more than anything else? And they absolutely came alive. And it was what I was talking about earlier, this idea that if you want to reach a young person, you start off with what they're passionate about. So 65% of all kids will tell you immediately what they love doing. And the other 35%, you can just you know, give them a few prompts, like what did you do last weekend, or how do you spend your free time, or if you could go on vacation, you know, what would you be doing you know, if you weren't in school, or you know, these kind of things. So if you can find out what young people are passionate about, then I think we can connect them with the big problems facing the planet, and we can show them how kids are using football to mitigate hunger in America, how kids are using creative writing uh, to help um, you know, first-generation immigrants get jobs, that we can show you how you know, your passion for cooking or baking can actually solve the hunger problem in your community. And then you know, when, when kids realize that they already have value and that, that we actually need you know, that, that passion, that spark, that you know, skill that they love, and that they can use that to make the world a better place, well, then, you know, there's just no stopping them. So that's our big secret right there is meeting young people where they are. And, and then I think the other big news that, that we announced this year is that for the first time in human history, the United Nations has created something called the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And these are the 17 goals that every country on the planet voted on. It's n at no time in human history has this ever happened before. So we have 17 goals. We have 15 years to solve these goals, to reach these goals. And they're extraordinary. They're big. They're complicated. And yet, if we don't figure them out, you know, you might as well write off the human race. And they run from issues of health to human rights to economic opportunity and, of course, the environment. So how do we make the planet sustainable? How do we make the economy available for everybody? How do we make sure everybody has enough to eat and, you know, water um, to drink? And so when you look at these goals, um, they're well organized. The UN did a spectacular job with them. And, of course, the U.S. was one of the countries that, you know, voted on them in favor of them. So now we have a plan. Now we actually have a manual for saving the planet. And so what we're doing is looking at these 17 goals, and we're going to align all the work that we're doing around the world with these 17 goals. And the good news is that let's say goal 14, which is life under the sea, so that's everything from marine conservation to fisheries depletion you know, to coral reef restoration, things like that. That's goal 14. Well, that's goal 14 in Boston. It's goal 14 in Barcelona. It's goal 14 in Bombay. And, and that's the really great news is that this, uh, you know, sort of framework of problems and the solutions are now global and that we can get kids to work on these same things um, because we now have a common language that we can use in every country on the planet. So I think that's one of the big exciting things that we're doing is, and, and we're looking at technology that will, you know, ask a young person, like, what is your passion? You know, what do you love doing? And then show them how they can plug that passion into one of the 17 goals. You know, how can I use, you know, my passion for writing plays um, you know, to help um, gender equality, or how can I, um, I love playing soccer, you know, how can I use soccer um, to help with renewable energy? And so we're going to have a whole series of, of cool projects that other kids have already done and give them ideas and, and, again, try to seed, you know, new entrepreneurial solutions where young people bring their skills and their passions to the table and use those to make the world a better place. Why was partnering with, with after school something that YSA decided to do? 
Well, after school, you know, just blew us away um, when we learned about, you know, just the, the incredible reach that you all have and, and how we had this shared value um, that is still a pretty radical idea in that we both trust young people. Um, and we see a really strong value proposition, you know, in young people. And I want to remind people, you know, it, you know, not only did women not have the vote, you know, less than a couple of generations ago, um, but young people were really told that they were to be seen and not heard. And, you know, programs that were, you know, theoretically youth development programs, you know, they couldn't wait, you know, and, and these are good-hearted people, I, you know, I, I, I want to say that up front. But, you know, these were programs that did at people, at young people, you know, it did for young people, it, it programs that did to young people, but very rarely with them. And, and very rarely, you know, did it, did these programs get set up so that young people were the actors, you know, um, instead of being the recipients. So I think we're going through a, a, a real change of heart. And, and I think what after school is, you know, is on exactly that same page where it, it really sees a value proposition in young people before they grow up, you know, while they're still young, um, that you don't have to wait until you're 21 or 25 or 30. You don't have to wait until you have a job. You don't have to wait until you have, you know, a, a family or you don't have to wait until your kids grow up and leave, you know. Um, you can actually be a leader now. Uh, and in fact, the problems are so big facing us right now that we can't afford for kids to grow up before they start changing the world. So I, I think we have that shared value, and I think we each bring, you know, exciting, um, you know, kinds of, of gifts to the table. And so we are really looking forward to expanding our partnership with you guys. And so looking at, at a parent's place in this, how would you recommend a parent get the most out of their child when it comes to preparing them to make a positive difference in their community and the world? Well, you know, I have never met a parent, and I've been doing this now for 20 years, uh, I have never met a parent who didn't want their child to be a good and gracious human being. Um, and as a matter of fact, you know, I think it's something that keeps parents up at night. You know, how do I do that? How do I get my, my child involved? And um, so I think we have them on our side of the, you know, of the line from the start. I will also tell you that I've never seen, you know, a, a really amazing uh, young person who is changing the world who also doesn't have a parent or an adult champion. You know, there's that great line that every young person is one caring adult away from success. Well, I, I think every change maker is one you know, carrying adult away from being their champion. And so we need parents um, front and center, you know, as, as part and parcel of this, um, of this effort. And I think it's really um, helping parents, you know, to, to really understand that they can give their child permission, you know, to change the world at a young age. They can expose them. Don't be afraid, you know, expose them to the big problems facing the planet. Explain what climate change is and how, you know, even by not um, running the water when they brush their teeth, um, that they're contributing to making a better world by recycling, you know, um, and, you know, by just some of the small steps that then lead to a larger change of heart in how they look at the world. But, you know, I had a dad the other day come up to me and he said, what are you doing to my child? And I said, I don't know, what am I doing? <laughs> and he said, he's four. And he came home from preschool and he said, dad? We have to reduce, reuse, and recycle. And I said, yes, this is great. And he looked at me and he laughed, you know, and he said, what's he going to be like when he's 14? And he's four now, you know. And I said, I don't know, but I can't wait, you know. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think some of this is also coming from schools. I think parents can, can be turning to their teachers and saying, you know, what are the kids learning um, in school about their capacity to contribute? Um, how can they actually use some of the things they are learning? How do you use math, for example, to make the world a better place? How do you use technology to make the world a better place? Um, there's lots and lots of curriculum and, and cool ideas out there. Um, and, you know, you can find a lot of this stuff at, on our website at ysa.org. But, you know, I, I think um, with parents having the expectation that their child is going to be a change maker, I think is, is really the way to start. 
and um, there are lots and lots of resources. You know, once they make that decision and to say, yeah, I, I think this is part of of being a good parent is making sure that my child is a good citizen, is a contributor, is is not a taker but a giver, you know, is not a spectator but but they're an actor. And the last question here, looking at the, the team themselves, if they're listening or, or reading this article, how would you recommend that they get involved and, you know, go after their dreams, make a difference in the world? Well, again, I would I would start you know, in their own backyard, and and I would start kind of in their own heart. Um, what do they What do they love doing? You know, um, what do they love doing, and what are they good at? Um, and sometimes those aren't the same thing. Um, you know, they may be a really good writer, but they don't like to write, um, and that's okay. You know, they they should still kind of say, well, you know, grin and bear it, and you know, darn it, I am a good writer, and and I I need to learn to love what I'm good at. <laughs> but my point is that. Um, you know, figure out what the assets are that they have. And it may be they have time. It may be that they're a great athlete. It may be that they're a great singer. It may be that they're, a, you know, a, a great artist. Um, it may be that they're really good in the kitchen. It may be that they're really, um, really fascinated by technology and they learn to code at a young age. And then I think, you know, taking a look at, at some of the issues that are facing their community, you can take those 17 goals um, and we're putting up on, on our website, for each one of the 17 goals, we're going to put up four different exemplary projects that young people can immediately you know, emulate and, and, uh, and put their own stamp on. They don't have to imitate them exactly, but you know, these are, are, are projects that other young people have done uh, you know, to create social change in their community, and these are projects that, that they can do as well. So. I think, you know, starting there, um, what do I bring to the table? What's the big problem that I'm passionate about? Is it animals? You know, is it, um, do I live by the beach? And I really, you know, I'm worried about turtles and, and uh, uh, restoration there. Am I worried about the fact that I live in a community with no water and we seem to waste a lot of it? Um, you know, do I live in the mountains? And, and, you know, there's issues of clean streams and runoff from, you know, mining operations. Um, Whatever whatever the issues are, you know that are are facing that community, I guarantee you that young person has something to give and something to contribute. Great, and once again, uh, this has been Michael Lukies from After School with Steve Culbertson, and as he said, you can head over to ysa.org to find out more about what they're doing to learn about. To learn more about After School, you can visit afterschoolapp.com. Steve, thanks again for your for your insight. Thanks, Michael. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Same here. Take care. Bye.